During the late 50s, I was employed by the Department of Supply in Perth, and as part of my duties, I was asked to attend a large public hospital and receive from the pathology department of that hospital a package which I was to on forward to the Eastern States. On receiving this package, I identified bones as being those of young children. I thought to myself, bloody hell, what's going on here? Soon after Marston delivered his report, the safety committee contacted pathologists in every capital city. They were asked to provide bones from bodies undergoing autopsy. I was able to talk to the people in the pathology department as to what this was all about. And I was told that the bones were taken to the Eastern States, they were ashed and analysed for the presence of strontium-90. Throughout 1958, more than 400 bone samples were analysed. In all cases, the next of kin were never told. The secretary of the safety committee wrote to all of the participating pathologists very early in the program uh, a letter saying, it may have occurred to you that the general public would not take kindly um, to the question of removal of bones for purposes of radioactive uh, testing and I therefore ask you to um, uh, treat this matter as, as confidential. The bones of people of all ages were analysed, but the safety committee requested as many from babies and stillborns as possible. We know that in some cases whole femurs of a baby, of babies were taken out. Perhaps little tiny bones, maybe only that big. Um, um, in other cases it was skull samples, vertebrae, because they could easily be taken out from autopsy. In Titterton's first report to the government, Marston's suspicions had been realised. Strontium-90 was indeed widespread in the Australian population. Infants showed levels up to five times higher than adults. But the levels, Titterton claimed, were well below the safety threshold and would not cause damage to cells or result in cancer. The issue was that there was no real knowledge of whether there was a threshold value um, below which it was safe to get radioactivity. The safety committee assumed there was. Headley said there's no evidence for that and you have no right to reassure the public that they are not in any danger. It was a question now dividing scientists around the globe. Was there a safe level of radioactive fallout? According to the best estimates of geneticists, all of whom agree, 15,000 children are sacrificed for every large bomb tested. It is possible there is damage. It is even possible, to my mind, that there is no damage. And there is the possibility, furthermore, that very small amounts of radioactivity are helpful. But the most dramatic assessment came at an international conference attended by Mark Oliphant. Twenty of the world's leading scientists warned Strontium-90 could irreversibly damage the human race. The elephant came back very reassuringly to Marston, saying that the kind of uh, opinions that were now merging internationally on this question of fallout were entirely vindicating his own opinion. Finally, in August 1958, after 18 months of stalling by the safety committee, Marston succeeded in publishing an edited version of his report in a respected CSIRO journal. But far from the political explosion Headley Marston had predicted, the story was only reported in a small circulation farmer's newspaper. The major city papers ignored it completely. Why didn't the Sydney Morning Herald? Why didn't Melbourne Sage? Why didn't Adelaide's advertiser, 
when this article talked about the contamination of one of the cities of Australia and across the whole of Australia. Headley was pretty sure that the government used its uh, influence to ensure that the media did not uh, pick this up. The politicians didn't want the Australian public alarmed having got themselves into this mess. Despite the weight of Marston's evidence, the public remained largely unaware that atomic testing had contaminated much of their country. But then in 1959, something unexpected occurred. During the second year of the Strontium-90 survey, radiation in the bones of children increased by 50% even though Britain and the other nuclear powers had agreed to a freeze on atomic testing. Such a dramatic increase meant that some of the contamination was coming from elsewhere. The only possible source was from past American and Russian hydrogen bomb explosions which had sent strontium-90 into the stratosphere and was now slowly falling to Earth. Increased use of bigger and bigger devices by the Americans and the Russians meant that fallout was now becoming a global problem. So that everybody on Earth was getting a dose of radiation and the consequences of this, if it had gone unchecked, would have been quite significant. Regardless of dramatic increases in reported cases of leukemia in many countries, the nuclear powers resumed atmospheric testing in the early 1960s. In 1962, the world rocked to about one nuclear explosion a week. And the levels of fallout were just going up dramatically. It really was getting to the stage where, where would it all end? A few years ago, scientists of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, working in cooperation with the Public Health Service and the Atomic Energy Commission, developed a laboratory method for removing radioactive strontium-90 from milk. As Headley Marston had discovered, strontium-90 was indeed the Achilles heel of nuclear weapons advocates. The loss of even one human life or the malformation of even one baby who may be born long after all of us have gone should be of concern to us all. Our children and grandchildren are not merely statistics towards which we can be indifferent nor does this affect the nuclear powers alone. These tests befoul the air of all men. 